Last up here, Katie Walmersley is a self-taught developer and engineer leader. In college, she studied philosophy and economics and then completed a master's program in managerial economics. She currently serves as the VP of Engineering at Buffer, which is a globally distributed team with zero offices. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. She's co-authored 97 Things Every Engineering Manager Should Know, an Atomic Migration Strategy for Web Teams, both with O'Reilly, the publisher, not the automotive group. Katie is currently the lead author, author on The Definitive Guide to Remote Work, coming soon through Holloway. She is a champion of remote work and believes distributed teams are the future of technology. Please put your hands together for Katie. Yeah, okay. okay. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's <laughs> lovely to be here. You're uh, getting some Andes tonight, is that right? I am. I hear the concrete is the thing to get, and apparently there are many flavors, so I'm hoping for birthday cake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so I'm curious. We were, we were debating beforehand. I'm a Sunday guy at Andes, so, so hands for concrete. Oh, okay. I'll mm. just... Whatever. I have made the correct yeah. choice. Y'all are wrong. Yeah. Get out of here. All right. So there's so much I want to talk to you about tonight, but uh, let's just start off with maybe uh, finding out how you ended up as in this role um, as an engineer leader at Buffer. Let's tell me about this. Yeah. So as you know in my bio, I am a self-taught developer. I ended up studying economics and philosophy, and then... When it came to doing something practical to sell my labor, I didn't really want to go to a drill bit factory in Manchester, which is what I was trained up for. So I, I tinkered with websites. Um, I'd sort of done that through college. And I sort of thought, well, I'll try and make a go of this. And I literally approached everyone I knew, my doctor, my dentist, my, um, my in-laws. And I was like, hey, can I build you a website? Like, it'll be really good, like, I promise. And I, I did that, um, did a little more seriously, um, built up a portfolio. I started getting sort of more corporate clients. Um, it was fun. And I think during that time, I learned a lot of the skills that I now use as, as a manager and as a leader. Because I'm sure a lot of you know, if you've ever worked with clients or done contracting work, there's a lot of business stuff that you're trying to take care of. You're trying to keep the client happy. You're trying to manage conflicting priorities. You're trying to explain to them how like good, cheap, and fast is just not a thing. And it's also not upset them. Um, so that was great. It was also really, really hard work. So after a couple of years, I um, worked for a startup remotely, um, a South African company called Lackaslop. And when I moved to Canada, which is about four years ago now, I then took the opportunity to change jobs and I joined Buffer. It was during this time when I'd worked for this remote startup that I'd become interested in Buffer and remote work and how to be a better remote worker myself. And then I applied to Buffer thinking, well, you know, I'll, might as well apply. And sort of to my shock, I, I ended up working there. I still couldn't quite, quite believe it. Um, yeah, and I think it was those skills I developed as a freelancer, as a contractor running my own agency that then when I found myself as a dev on various product teams, often playing that role of trying to negotiate between what engineering needed and what product needed and advocate for my teammates, um, I did this quite naturally. And after a while, I told our then CTO, just so you know, I don't code that much anymore, but this is really needed. And at that point, I became Buffer's first sort of official engineering manager. You know, we'd had kind of tech leads or senior engineers before that, but that was the first sort of engineering management title that we'd brought in. Um, yeah, and that, that was great. I enjoyed it a lot. And you can ask Jordan in the audience if it's uh, been good. So, <laughs> woo! <laughs> Two thumbs up. How, Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> how big was Buffer when you came on? Um... So I think we're about 17 or 18 people in engineering. 
And I can't remember the company as a whole um, at that point. It was probably about 80 people. We had a much bigger sales customer engagement team than we have now. And today we're a similar company size. We're 90, but we're 37 in engineering if you include the data team. So the composition of the company has changed to become more engineering heavy over time. Nice. So cool. And so you mentioned yes. your, your educational background. How do you feel that um, helped get that position? Like, it's a very diverse background, so I'm just curious right. how, that, how that influenced um, getting that position. I don't think it helped me get the position at all. But I think it helped me once I was there. So I don't think anyone was like, oh, philosophy, you'd be great at managing things. That's probably not what they thought, um, or economics. Um, also, at Buffer, we don't really emphasize your degrees or your credentials. But I do find that increasingly I draw on that background. So early on in my career, I honestly thought that I'd wasted a ton of money. It was a colossal mistake, and I should never have gone to college. Um, and it took me a long time to make peace with my background. And today I find that background quite useful because a lot of the, the economics, the, the philosophy, the logical thinking, the thinking from first principles, when you're trying to set strategy, you figure out like what's going to work, you use that kind of thinking a lot more. So I think it has now come in handy, um, although I spend a lot of time in my early career regretting it. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> Uh, so in in your bio, you mentioned you know, that, that you're a champion of remote work. So can, mm -hmm. can you tell us just a little bit about that passion and, and why yeah. you think it is the future? Well, I would not be a developer and I would not be where I was today if it wasn't for remote work. So I am a South African from Cape Town that's self-taught, that found myself in the Bay Area, but because of U.S. immigration reasons, I couldn't work for an American company. And my options were literally work remotely for somebody in South Africa or just don't work at all. And I'm very passionate about my work. So that was the one way that I had to access the labor market, like given who I was and what I was doing. And after a while, it also became one of the main ways that living in an area, Canada, that then wasn't the Bay Area, it was one of the only ways that I could get access to a top tier company like Buffer. You know, I didn't have the ability to just move to Silicon Valley with a work permit and go and work for whatever startup might hire me, I literally had to figure out, okay, well, what are my options? And that perspective has made me sort of think globally, how do we get access to the best jobs and how do companies get access to the best developers and the best talent? And I do think remote work is the answer to that. It's like, what are the chances that the best person for the job you need is gonna be within five miles of where you're sitting it just seems like a bizarre way to think about the world. And then also, like, what are the chances that what's best for you and your career and what you care about, what are the chances that that job is going to be, like, within a commuting range from where you're currently sitting? Um, and some of us can move. I know a lot of you in America, you have a lot of those options. Um, but sometimes you don't want to. Like, you have families, you have communities. Like, you just you want to work from home. You want to be there to support your family. And I think those are all valid reasons to not want to up and move to Silicon Valley. Love it. And do you think that um, other companies are, are getting this? Do you, do you see this spreading um, in, in a big way currently? Well, with coronavirus... Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is working from home right now. Um, but no, um, inappropriate jokes aside, I, <laughs> I, I do see a lot of interest in remote work growing, um, especially as um, millennials and Gen Z want much more flexible work options, um, especially in the tech sector. The global number of developer jobs far exceeds the number of actual developers. So there's something like 1.3 jobs for every one developer um, and increasing demand for technical skills means that companies need to look further afield. So the I can't hire problem is the, the one biggest problem that's pushing employers into considering remote work. And I do see that rising a lot. And then just technology is making it much more feasible. Like even today compared to five years ago, the tools we have are better, internet speeds are faster, video conferencing works better. We've got you know remote collaboration tools. Um, it's a lot different than when Buffer was starting six, seven, eight years ago to be fully remote. Like the ecosystem is just much more supportive right now. Yes, uh, I, I I consider myself now a champion of remote work too. I love that phrase. Mission accomplished. It's it's I, I've always been a big fan of that. And and um, living in the Midwest, 
um, and, and seeing people like Jordan, right, working for these companies out here. I worked a little bit for a company out on the West Coast, and uh, I, it seems like that trend is growing a bit more, and, and the Midwest is, you know, starting to be taken a little bit more seriously as far as, like, the talent that resides here, so. Yeah, yeah I mean, the Kansas City Developer Conference is, like, 1,500 developers. It's, yep. Yep. Yeah, Huge. it's yeah. a lot, yeah. So cool. So in the United States and, and, and elsewhere, uh, the technology field, as we all know, has been a primarily male-dominated field. Uh, I, I'm just uh, curious, have you faced any gender or diversity-related challenges in your career? So that's a really um, tricky question to answer because if I say, um, yes, I have, there's there's a lot of like oh wow okay well that's a that's a tricky question and if I say like no like not at all then you know all the women are going to say well what are you talking about like what planet are you on so um, what I would like to sort of say I think everyone faces challenges in their careers um, because everybody has something that you're at a disadvantage based on and I'm sure there were a lot of those structural challenges. Um, but something that I really appreciate that made a big difference to my career, being a woman in tech, is the support of male allies that I worked with. So people on my team that were able to support me, advocate for me, speak about my contributions in meetings, people that would be you know, well thought of in the organization that had that privilege, essentially advocate on my behalf. And having access to supporters and allies that would do that work for me made the difference, I think, between sort of feeling, well, there's no one that looks like me succeeding here, so I can't succeed either. And thinking, well, the people who succeed here, they believe in me, and so maybe um, maybe they're not so wrong. Or I don't want them to realize that they're wrong, so I'm just going to try my best anyway because I don't want to let these people down. So the support of all of the, the male coworkers I had, my, my allies at work, I think made a huge difference in, in overcoming the, the systemic challenges that there, there definitely are. I don't want to say there aren't systemic challenges, that there are for sure, but they're, um, they're not a deal breaker and you can still have a really good experience. And this audience is predominantly white men and that's great because you can be this person to the woman that you work with. If there's a, a woman engineer on your team, it's like you can literally change her career and change her future by being that ally. So if you want to figure out how to do that better and how to be that person, come talk to me after and I will give you the homework. That's really good insight. Thanks. So is a good leader born or molded? And mm -hmm. uh, can anyone be a good leader? Um, I don't think anything is born. I think every single quality is molded. There, there are, like, I don't think I could ever run very well, so there's, there's that. Um, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, certainly, like, th there are attributes that are going to be, you know, helpful, but I think that the most important um, quality in a leader, the research shows the most important quality in a leader is actually, are you an ethical person? Do people trust you to make moral decisions? And I don't think morality is something that you're born with. Morality is something that you learn. And then the second most important quality in a leader, and this is, again, according to the research, is um, leaders grow. They are constantly striving to do better. They are constantly learning from the people around them and trying to figure out what are their blind spots, how can they improve, and what is it that they can do to better serve their teams and their organizations. I think if you're the kind of person that thinks leaders are born, you're probably not going to have the growth mindset focus to be a great leader. So I would say... Believing that good leaders are molded and not born is probably a necessary component to becoming a great leader. Love it. Love it. Um, are teams better when they are diverse, uh, say, in terms of gender, age, culture, mm -hmm. just generally diverse? It depends what you mean by better. So... Uh, teams that are more diverse, the research shows that they are more profitable, um, they're more innovative, um, and they also tend to have better retention. So if you're looking for a team that makes money, comes up with new ideas, and where people stick around, um, then yes, the research does show that diverse teams do better. If you're looking for a team where you can like make really whatever jokes you want, like then it's not going to be better for you, right? So it depends on how you define better. I would feel they're better because I do care about things like coming up with new ideas, being a good place to work, and making more money. So I would say yes. But yeah, it depends on your definition there. I think we can all agree that the 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 first thing is uh, much better than being able to make all the jokes you want. So yes, absolutely. 
So you've written a bit uh, about preventing burnout uh, and maintaining one's mental health. How do you promote this kind of culture within Buffer? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it a lot. It's very important, um, I think, for everybody to be aware that mental health, just like physical health, is something that needs maintenance. It It's a fact that most of us will at some point in our lives struggle from either depression or anxiety. Like, if you never have, you're in the vast minority. And most people feel that they're very alone when they have these experiences. They feel um, very worried about talking to their coworkers. So one of the best things that you can do in a workplace is start to normalize talking about mental health. And if you're in a leadership position, you have the ability to normalize it, to make it a lot safer to talk openly about mental health. So some strategies you can do, use to do that. Um, I try to talk about it a lot. I put appointments with a therapist on my public work calendar, just like I would to the dentist or if I was going to go to the gym. It's just another aspect of my health that I need to maintain. Um, I also talk quite publicly about taking an SSRI, an antidepressant, which I use for anxiety. And it's really helpful. I wish I'd done it sooner. It's great if you have chronic mental health issues, like if you don't make enough serotonin on your own, store-bought is fine. <laughs> so I think a lot of it's breaking the stigma there. Fantastic. Um, so I, I just a lot of us in here, you know, working for a fully distributed team is is something that many of us may have no idea what that's like. And so j just the co concept of dealing with burnout specifically, right? Just working so so much um, is something I think a lot of us can identify with. When you were fully distributed. Uh, the 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 communication is very different, right? Talking online and 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 you know not being able to huddle together in a room physically. Um, I'm I'm just curious, like burnout wise, do you do you preach uh, a certain amount of workload? Like, are you very serious about that? Do people just go off on their own and, and just work a ton? Like, do you actively try and prevent stuff like that from happening? And and what do those meetings even look like? Mm. Yes. Okay. So, um, yes, in a distributed team, people will work, work more than they would in a co-located setting because they can't prove to their coworkers that they were actually trying by showing up to the office. So especially if there's been like some kind of personal errand they had to take care of, if they had an unproductive day, stuck in a bug, something that you'll often see in a distributed team is, oh, I, I might have worked a reasonable number of hours, but I didn't get enough done, and maybe people will think I'm not working. So I'm going to work through the night to try and get some tangible results to show for it because people feel that their team and their manager doesn't trust them. So you have to proactively counteract that because in a distributed team where you don't see people going home or taking breaks, everyone tends to think that they're the least productive member of their team, that everyone else is much better than them and that they're being constantly judged. So we speak a lot with our team being like, you're doing a good job. Like, this is a great amount of work that you're doing. Like, that is fine. We encourage people to take time off. If I know somebody's gone through a stressful time, I'll speak to them and, you know, actively say, like, I think you should take sick leave. It's not even about take a vacation day. It's like, no, you seem like you're really struggling or we've had a tough deadline and people have worked overtime. When that happens, and it sometimes does happen, we'll encourage people to take extra time to compensate. So if you worked a, an extra sort of half day, we'll say just take a full day off, you know, take, take some time, um, recharge. It is a constant, constant battle that you have to be aware of. I think if you're a remote manager, you can do a lot there. But if you're a remote worker yourself, just don't burn yourself out. It's really hard to say, but you will not be as productive. Like you'll get a lot done for three weeks and then you will suffer a decrease in productivity. You will find yourself unable to think creatively, unable to solve problems. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a developer stuck on a really tricky bug and convince them to just like go home and come back the next day and just relax. And then they come back and solve it in half an hour and they're like, oh, it wasn't that hard. Happens all the time. So my best advice there, if you are in the situation, is trust that your brain will figure it out if you give it enough rest and nutrition and reprieve from work. Constantly staring at your text editor is just not going to get you anywhere. So don't do it. Amen. So you mentioned go home. Uh, how, how many... Machine. <laughs> 
how many of uh, of the engineering team uh, has an office. I know Jordan, uh, Jordan works, has, works in a co-working yeah. space. Uh, I'm curious how many don't work at home and they have a space. I think it's about half-half. So it depends on how you work best. A lot of people find it's very useful to have the separation of a co-working space where you go in, you keep almost like office hours. When you're done, you're done, it's 4 or 5 p.m., you're going to go home physically. So a lot of people find that really helpful. So Buffer pays for that, we encourage it. Other people don't really enjoy it. So I personally just work from home because I generally start kind of early and I'm a hermit and don't like to leave <laughs> my apartment at all when I can help it. So um, so it's about half off. And when, when I say go home, what I really mean is like turn off, like be right. offline and, and don't quickly check in on Slack or um, Discord or whatever you're using or be like, oh, I'm just going to like look at GitHub and like did so-and-so get back to me on that PR. Like maybe I can quickly merge it in the middle of the night. Like, yeah. Very cool. No. You're, uh, so, so you work at home. Um, walk us through a, a typical day um, in an in engineering uh, manager role. Let's, right. let's hear this. Right. So this is the manager schedule. So don't panic if you're not a manager. <laughs> Um, so my typical day, I wake up at 5.45 in the morning because I really enjoy my morning routine. I make coffee, I light candles, I hang out, I greet my plants, I chat to, you know, one of my partners, or I just hang out by myself, meditate. So that's great. And then I usually start my meetings at 7. I'm in Vancouver, so I'm about as west as our team gets. And we have a lot of people in Europe, other time zones. So because I am a manager, I don't want to have other teammates working late. I don't want people to be taking meetings at like 6, 7, 8 p.m. Europe time. So I start at 7. It's not that bad. My dad's a dairy farmer. He starts at like 4.30, so it could be worse. <laughs> um, and I usually do, do um, morning meetings. I will typically have a bunch of meetings through to sort of like 10, 11, do a bit of work. Um, I do a gym class over lunch, and that's great. I love that. Nice. So yeah, that structure helps me a ton. And then in the afternoon, I tend to have fewer meetings. It's kind of quieter in the Pacific time zone in the afternoons. So that's when I'll get time to do whatever shallow work managers tend to do. So it's not like those like big conceptual pushing forwards of projects, but that's when I'll get back to various emails, updates, career framework changes that we need to make, like whatever else needs doing. So that's usually a couple hours in the afternoon, like two, three. And I'm usually done by three, four PM, which is really nice. So I've got like a long, nice evening to see friends, hang out. So that schedule works really well for me. Um, and I say that's that's pretty typical. So I, I tend to have a meeting heavy morning and then exercise. And yeah, and what my meetings are, there's a combination of meeting with my peers and the exec team. So sort of like strategic meetings, keeping projects on track, big milestones, um, meeting with my manager, direct reports, how your team's going, how can I support you as a manager? And then one-to-ones um, -one with engineers in the org, which is like, how are we doing as a company? What should we do better? And those are really important. So speaking with the engineers is something that I spend a lot of time doing and really value. Speaking of your your two to three o'clock time, when you've got emails and messages uh, you're you're responding to, you did an interesting thing uh, about a year or two ago where you turned Slack off completely for a period of time. Can you tell us about that and and what that was like? It was fascinating. Nothing happened. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so of, of course, like I I say, this is somebody that has some sort of power in my organization and my my boss, the CEO, is a very sort of future thinking person. So I'm not gonna get fired for not responding to a Slack ping. So I want to caveat this advice. Like don't if, <laughs> if you're not in that situation, um, then don't just disappear off Slack because that might have career consequences for you. Um, but in terms of how important is it to respond to messages right away, usually it's not important to the task at hand. Like very few things are urgent. What I did with this experiment was put in my profile, if it truly is urgent, just call me on the phone, like call me on my cell phone, and no one ever did. <laughs> so <laughs> um, no nothing urgent ever really happened. A lot of people feel there's a sense of urgency. It's like, oh, I'm wondering about a thing, tell me now. It's like, do you really need to know whether you can expense that monitor like this instant? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I can, I'll tell you at 3 p.m., yeah. I think we could all take a page out of that book, yeah. for sure. 
So the the whole uh, you know remote team stuff is is still incredibly fascinating for me. I, I worked remote for about a year and just learned a ton uh, about that culture. Um, and so I'm just curious, like tool wise, uh, what what do you guys use for for meetings for collaboration? Again, not having that real world tangible like we're in a room together working is is I think something that. Uh, a lot of days, we, we, all of us would be okay with, but at, at some times, like, that can be a really crucial component to be able to uh, get something done. So what does that look like with remote? Right. So the, the tools we use, um, we use a ton of tools. So I'm going to give you the, the sort of um, our most used kind of day-to-day um, we use Slack as our sort of hub where there's a lot of integrations, where we'll kick off team meetings from. Um, so that's sort of our group chat space. But we try to keep Slack to only things that really um, need to be synchronous. So social chatter, meetings that are happening around now, like, hi, is everyone around? We're going to, like, kick off our weekly retro. That'll happen in Slack. Um, you know, fun chatter, sharing gifts. We, so we do that there. For the meetings that we kick off, we use Zoom, the video conferencing platform. It's pretty good. Like we, we've we been happy with it. And it can handle up to 100 people at one time, in case you're wondering. Can't speak for more than that. Um, then we also use a tool called Threads, which is a pretty new tool. It's great. It combines email and a sort of announcement board for us. So I don't know if anyone's ever used something like um, discourse as a sort of company, a virtual announcement board. So threads is like that, but it also brings in a lot of the functionality for email. So we don't really use email at all internally. We use threads and we also use threads for posting announcements. Um, that's been really helpful in reducing the sort of overall amount of communication and the question of what goes where and what am I going to find where. We use Dropbox Paper for collaborating on documents. Of course, we use GitHub for collaborating with code. Our task management system is Jira. The next gen Jira looks a lot like Trello, and it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> um, yeah, and what else? I'm sure I'm missing a ton, but I could go on about this for a long time. So if there's any specific thing you want to ask me, like what do you use for X, come find me after. Yeah, that video chat was one I was curious about. Um, and so... Bringing it back to having an office space where, where people are in there personally, um, it's very easy to, to walk up to somebody and be like, hey, I'm working on Problem X or, or maybe even an urgent issue um, and just trying to get that immediate feedback. Yeah. Uh, remotely, is, is that something that is a bit more structured and you have times maybe for that kind of thing or, or is it still pretty available to, to ping anybody kind of at, at will to, to talk through something? I mean, you can ping whoever you want, but like <laughs> they might not respond. Sure. So it, it, it depends on your time zone. So um, yeah, we're absolutely encourage people to ask for help. We will always give help. We don't, we don't really encourage that solitary person that's going to solve everything by themselves. If you're stuck on a problem, just ask your team to help you. But of course, if you're working in an isolated time zone, there might not be anyone around to help you. So that's where it does get a little bit tricky. And as a result, traditionally, Buffer's hiring has skewed more senior for that reason. We've needed to hire people that could unblock themselves. We've now started bringing in more intermediate and junior folks as we've become a little bit more confident as an organization about how to pick out good tasks, unblock people during the time zone overlap, make sure they're good to go for their work day, you know, circle back the next day, are you still on track? So we do that, um, but it is, it, it is quite intentional. It takes quite a bit of work because that is a big pitfall. Like if you're in um, Sri Lanka and you're stuck, you're just stuck. Like, you'll have to just pick up another task. And that's something we encourage as well. It's like, if you get stuck on something and you can't solve it, just do something else. Like, pick something else that's useful. As you all know, there's an endless fire hose of things that we really need done. So, um, you know, just wait until the next day and someone will unblock you. Um, but that's definitely a downside of remote work. And what I do see is that I think people on our team struggle with problems by themselves for much longer than I wish they would. Like, I wish we would ask for help a lot sooner than we currently do. Yep, that, that can be a problem, yes. Uh, can you tell us about any leadership mistakes you've made? And then on the opposite side, uh, some big leadership successes. So leadership mistakes, I think the 
the sort of first leadership mistake I made as a manager was feeling very worried about what my actual contribution was. I'm sure you've all seen that image of um, it's like one poor worker digging the hole and then there's like 10 people around and it's like, IT dev manager, project manager, program manager, and like all watching this one person dig the hole. So I didn't want to be that manager. And as a result, I was like trying to manage this team and, and also trying to code as well to like stay current and figure out how I could help my team by getting involved in projects which would actually just block them because I wouldn't have the time to do it properly or, you know. So that's probably my biggest sort of early manager mistake, and it's a it's a very typical one. It's like the it's literally you're unable to understand what your value is now that you are no longer producing concrete results, and so then you go and meddle with other people and micromanage them because you're trying to help. So that would be my my first sort of um, classic leadership mistake. Which e even knowing like I knew I shouldn't micromanage, but I didn't think I was micromanaging. I thought I was being helpful. Um, so I, I think that's why. So many people do it. Um, let's see. Success. Wow. Yeah, my biggest leadership success. It's always difficult when somebody asks you about your successes. You're like, oh, no successes. Yeah, none. No. No. <laughs> um, you got Jordan Morgan. That's yeah. a heck of a success. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, that's I'll big. <laughs> Um, well, that's, yeah, that was very nice of him. Um, I think my biggest success is growing the team from about 18 when I joined to we're 37 now. And we, we have a very different team structure. We have five engineering managers. Everyone has a manager. We have career frameworks. But we haven't lost the sort of culture that makes our developers really autonomous, really productive, able to have a ton of impact, make decisions by themselves. So the thing I think I'm most proud of as a leader is having put in place um, sort of structure and process that actually did support engineers to do their best work and not just stifle them with a bunch of red tape. And yeah, I see, this is always interesting when someone you work with is in the audience because you want them to be like, what? <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Jordan. Um, but that's, that's probably my, my biggest um, thing I'm most proud of because that was why I wanted to be a manager in the first place. There's all these brilliant people that I wanted to help them be more brilliant and not not end up stifling that. And I think the other thing I'm proud of is that our team currently is pretty diverse. So we're now 40% women in our engineering team, up from um, I was the second woman that joined. So that was neat. And we're starting to have more people of color join our team as well. So I think that's been um, a journey that we have a long way to go on, but that I'm so far proud of our efforts. It sounds like it would be truly amazing to work under you. So I think Jordan's super lucky. This is, this is so cool. Uh, aside from writing your own books, which is just crazy. Um, would love to know uh, what you're currently reading. What, what book or books mm -hmm. are on your nightstand? Yes. Um, so I am reading um, the Murderbot Diaries series. It, by reading, I'm actually listening to it being read to me on Audible. It's very relaxing. But it's really great. It's Martha Wells. It's science fiction. I really enjoy science fiction. I am also reading a book that my um, therapist recommended called The Inside Out Revolution. I enjoy books on personal growth. And I don't know what it is yet. So I can't tell you what is the revolution. I don't know. Um, but apparently, it's great. So I enjoy books like Stoicism, um, How to Be More Resilient, How to Help People at Work, Growth Mindset. That was one that really resonated with me. So I enjoy that sort of genre. And then my favorite book ever, which is always on my um, nightstand, is Middlemarch. It's a very long, old book. And I probably read it once a year. And what I like about that is it focuses on the impact you make through the, the small acts that you do every day, the people you meet, the kindness you show, the the impact you can have in very small ways, because I think so much of our society focuses on sort of impact in a very big, flashy sense, you know, like having impressive titles or like making a lot of money or um, founding a really famous nonprofit. And you forget about like, well, are you kind to your family? Like, do you, you know, do you smile at the, the checkout person at the counter, you know, that sort of thing. So I read that book sort of constantly because it helps you remember that the people that you live life with other people right here with you, and it's important how you treat those people and the impact you have on those people. Get these on your list to read, yes. Um, I want to open this up to the audience, if that's if that's cool. Yeah, um, if, if we've got some questions, we can try and run this mic around, too, so it'll be a little bit easier. Uh, so just kind of raise your hand if you've got some questions for Katie. 
Oh, way back there. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to start up here first, all right? Hello. I'm curious how you um, became self-taught in development. Um, so literally how I learned to code by myself? Well, um, books. And I'm not even joking. I got these programming books and I like, worked through them <laughs> with code. So I wouldn't recommend that today. There's much better ways. Like you can do, um, you know, Coursera and Udacity and Udemy and Skill Crush and all the rest. But that was what I did. Um, and then what I also did was just sort of telling people I could do things I couldn't yet do and then using that as a pressure leverage to make myself do it and figure it out and ask questions on the internet and Google things and copy paste stuff from Stack Overflow and like stick it together. And it, it felt like I didn't understand anything for a full year and then woke up the next day and knew how to code because enough had coalesced in my brain. Um, yeah, so that, that was how I learned to code. Um, I think there's better ways now. Thanks. Yeah, the question I had was just about like growing a diverse team and if you had any tips on like how you hire for that. Yeah, outbound recruiting. So don't rely on people to find your company. Like go and troll Twitter and LinkedIn and reach out to candidates from groups that are underrepresented in your team, in your applicant pool, and actually say to them, like, you seem like a really great fit. I admire your work on specific thing about them that you looked up. And um, would you be interested in chatting a bit more? I think you could be a great fit for our team. And offer to do an informational interview with them and get them to apply. Interestingly, like, we have um, in our overall pipeline, the Candidate pool stats are still dominated by mostly men and mostly white people, but of the minority groups I see, almost all of them are highly qualified. So it's it's interesting, like you don't really tend to find a lot of people that are unqualified from minority backgrounds that you rule out right away. So it might sound like that's a lot of work, but you get a lot of really high quality applicants that way. And I mean, for every one role, you only need to hire one person. So yeah, it is a lot of work, so you kind of just do the outreach. And then there's a lot you can do with like the job boards and making your team and your hiring process more diverse. People are more likely to trust a hiring process where they can see people that look like them. So if you do have any members of minority groups um, on your team, trying to get them involved in the hiring process is probably going to help candidates have a better impression of your team and not feel like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I belong here. So you can do that too. What do you say to people who are against remote work? Don't do it. <laughs> Is there I, any I, argument I think, you make for that? Well, I, I think if you're against remote work, I don't think you're going to be a successful remote worker. And I don't think every person needs to work remotely. And similarly, if as a company you have a very strong in-office culture and that's something that you want to stick with, I wouldn't want to work for a company that didn't want to do remote work, that was somehow trying to. So I, I don't think that in-office work is going anywhere. Um, it's not that we want to try and replace every in-person job with a remote job, not at all. There's a lot of people that are well-suited to remote jobs. There's a lot of companies who feel that they can do it and they would benefit. And we should match those people up. We should help the companies that are interested in doing it, doing it better. And we should put them in touch with people who want to be remote workers. If you don't want to be a remote worker, like just go into an office. It's totally cool. And if you don't want to you know, offer remote work to your employees, then just don't do it. It's probably better than saying, oh yeah, sure, you can work remotely, but then making the organization really difficult for that remote worker um, because they'll just quit. You talked a bit um, about your formal education. I was just curious on um, how you think your philosophical uh, background affected um, your communication with your employees, if any. Made it very formal initially. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be like, um, you know, in pursuant to the matter at hand. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I do think that it helped. It helped my overall critical thinking skills. And what I find helped is 
Um, philosophy teaches you to distill issues into like their fundamental premises. It's like, so your premise is this, and distill that really crisply. And being able to like hear somebody ramble about a problem and say, okay, so the thing you're struggling with is that your product roadmap is changing faster than you can keep up with it. And they're like, yes. Then you're like, okay, like I understand your problem, I can help you. And that's very helpful for people to feel like you get it and you're gonna do something. So that process of being able to um, succinctly distill an argument to like its essence, I think is very important in communication. And you hear a lot of people, um, I don't know if you've heard the phrase low calorie words, when people, they, they say a lot of words, but you're, there's no like meaning, there's no like actual like semantic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> grit there. Um, so I think philosophy helps you not do that because it's very focused on every single word you choose, what is the meaning of it, and then the syntactics like, have you constructed it together in a logical way? The other thing is that like, I'm very trained to like, think through things very logically. So if somebody comes to me with a strategy and I'm like, your strategy is incoherent, I can spot it quickly, which is now useful. Yeah. Low calorie words. Yes, Daniel. Uh, so I work on a remote first team that you know everyone on the team. Um, it's only four people and so communication isn't uh, very difficult and we do it pretty well. Um, I worked on a remote first team beforehand that was over a thousand people with three to four hundred developers and it was kind of a managerial mess. So as your engineering team has grown, uh, what things have you had to change and do you think there's an upper limit to where uh, remote first teams work? That is a really good question. So I haven't experienced a team as big as where you worked before, um, but I can say that a lot of things do need to change as the team scales. And what really you need to figure out is the, the bounds of context for each subgroup of the organization. So you need to make sure that you, you can't have everyone communicating everything to each other with a thousand people. So what you really need to do there is make sure that the um, the groups of people that are working together have a context that they share, and that context is um, large enough that they have what they need, but small enough that they can still communicate effectively. So what you're asking me is essentially an organizational design problem. It's how do you correctly find those context boundaries? You know, can't just take 400 people and be like, make a blockchain, you know, like, you just does not work, um, but you can definitely split them up into subgroups where every subgroup owns a specific problem where they're small enough that they can still coordinate effectively and um, they are large enough that they're not just one person, right? They, they're large enough that they have the resources that they can own their problem. Um, so what you're really asking me there is the, the sort of classic, the universal scaling law or the mythical man month law. It's like, at what breaking points do the coordination costs of your communication outweigh um, the contribution of each extra person. And I do think that that um, limit is reached much more quickly with remote teams. So if in an in-person team, you might find that you can communicate effectively like 13, 14 devs on a team, I think when you're all remote, you're gonna find you reach that limit sooner. So I see like six, seven developers, like they start to hit on mythical man month problems, like add the eighth person, it's just not that helpful. So, um, that is what I would say is like the main difference. It's like your organizational context there need to be a bit smaller because you hit that mythical man month, person month point sooner when you're remote. And I think it's because um, we are social creatures. Most of our uh, communication is actually non-verbal. And so when we communicate through um, verbal words and written text, we're using a low bandwidth form of communication for us. And so we come up against our own communication challenges sooner than we would when we're in person. Um, but there is also the research that decisions made by groups of seven or more people are also ineffective. So I don't know, someone's probably gonna quote me now as saying like seven people is the maximum size. So I didn't say that exactly, but it's less than the in-person. <laughs> Thank all of you, this is a lot of fun. All right, so before we wrap this up,